Hey everybody. Uh, it, it is is nine Eastern. So it looks like we're gonna get started. We've got eight people in here already, and we'll uh, hopefully a few more people will trickle in. So um, before we get started, I want to introduce sort of what we're doing here. Uh, who are who these lovely faces uh, in front of you are, and just sort of give you a roadmap for uh, the webinar itself. Um, so my name is Tom Anowitz. I'm the College Division Manager at USA Ultimate. Uh, below, directly below me on your screen, you'll see Amy Hudson, who is the National Developmental College Coordinator. Uh, she is uh, an excellent volunteer uh, who uh, works to help put together programs like this. Um, we also have our two speakers, uh, Alyssa Weatherford and Jonathan Nethercutt. They probably need no introduction, but uh, Alyssa is a member of Riot, a coach of our under-20 national team. Uh, all, she is a coordinator and volunteer for USA Ultimate, and really just a, an all-around all -around great person. And Jonathan Nethercutt, another USA Ultimate volunteer. Uh, he was a member of was our member of mixed national team, a member of Ring of Fire, and uh, another, another great person who I'm very happy to present to you today. So as you know, the topic for the webinar is the off-season. We're going to focus on things to get your team ready for next year and things to get things that you can do to prepare yourself uh, in the off season while you're getting ready for the next college season. The goal of these webinars is to get you access to a lot of people who have who have done uh, have have done these things and have been successful in the ultimate community. Uh, we want to encourage you to ask questions. The our presenters are going to present for about 15, 20 minutes each. Feel free to use the chat function as they go and ask questions. We will be recording the questions, and then, and then we will be answering them in turn uh, when we are done. Is uh, just a quick question? I think there's a little bit of an echo. Can you guys? Are you guys getting an echo? If someone in the chat function can use the chat. All right, well, we'll figure out how to deal with that. Um, one second. Actually, not quite sure how to deal with it. So we'll we'll just have to. Is it is it good now? Yeah. If if you, I think that's exactly it. it should be muting of mics. Is this better? Is, is this, are we good now? I think we're good now. All right, excellent. Uh, in that case, I am going to step aside because you did not come to hear me talk. Um, first up, we have Alyssa Weatherford, uh, and we'll get going. I'm going to start, I just, I guess I have one, I don't, how do I, um, okay, I got it. Ah, hold on, sorry. Okay, great, here we go. Okay, figuring it out. Um, <laughs> here is a quick overview of um, some things that I would recommend and things that I have done before or some 
concepts that I am just now kind of coming up with. My focus is mostly on um, off-field um, kind of goals and activities that can be done with uh, your college team. So, um, great. Uh, the first thing is I would recommend having a postseason meeting with your leadership um, immediately, as soon as you can after the season, to really talk about um, pluses from the season, especially that has to do with um, leadership and team culture, um, and really like how the team was functioning throughout the end of the season. Um, and this can be with captains and coaches, and it might, if you have other people in like a leadership group, you would include those people. Um, and take notes. <laughs> I've done this before, and then I didn't take any notes, and then in the fall we forgot a lot of the things that we talked about. Um, and then I think that after a little bit of time, especially if you ended the season in kind of a disappointing way, um, give some time and then have a open meeting with the team and anyone who wants to come to talk about anything that's on their mind. Uh, and you can give some prompts or focuses, but I think it's a um, really good time to let people uh, speak and the leadership really just listen to what uh, people on the team have to say. Um, and once again, you might focus this on on and off field stuff, um, but I think it's really important to not forget about uh, team culture and um, as a thing. I think we get a lot, we get really stuck on X's and O's, and if that was, I feel like if that was the only thing that was like really, really important, um, then teams that have the best rosters on paper would always be the teams that win, right? There's always these other intangibles that are harder to define and harder to recreate and harder to find if you've never done that before. Um, and then I think soon after when you're done with your season, you should think about how you're going to elect your new leadership. Um, in the past, I have done people needing to self-nominate by peer nominations or coach nominations or some kind of combination. Um, I think it's best to decide which works best for your team, um, but I think it can be really powerful to have self-nominations for captains. Um, and it is can be a little bit challenging and putting yourself out there because it's a little scarier to like put yourself out there and say you want to do this and then have your team then tell you no <laughs> versus um, someone uh, not you and you're saying like, why not? Why not put my name in the hat and I'll like do my best. Um, and then also thinking about like if you want grade restrictions versus like seniors versus uh, younger people on the team. And just really thinking about the process of doing it. And I think doing it early is important because we to have those captains be able to know what's happening during the off season is really important to um, check emails and to do some of uh, and kind of run some of the, bunch, the other things that I am going to continue to talk about. And then deciding uh, how you're going to do this and if, if there's some kind of combination between an in-person meeting, an online survey, or like, and then deciding if the nominee, nominees are part of the discussion. Um, yeah, and I think this is something that people kind of overlook a little bit and decide that like, okay, well, like we'll just pick some captains or our best players is gonna be our captain, but um, there's a lot of off-field work that takes to putting together a team, especially with a lot of ultimate teams that are player run and maybe have a coach helping, but um, I think it's worth putting thought into how you are um, electing your new leadership for the next year. Um, cool, so my biggest thing about uh, recruiting is I think more captains and coaches should be talking to each other. A lot of teams in Ultimate are doing a really good job at recruiting um, and finding people that 
fit culturally with your team, either on campus or with youth. Um, and I think that sometimes people, you know, want to keep some of their secrets because they want to stay competitive, but I think if we want to grow our sport as a whole, that it's worth sharing and talking to other teams about what they're doing. Um, and then don't be afraid to try something you haven't done before. Like you might fail and that's okay, but if we, if you don't try different ways, then it's really hard to know like what's going to work. And if something like works kind of, um, really being able to uh, expand on that and see what else you can do. Um, but if, for long-term uh, recruitment, I think that it both working with youth as a college player, I think both helps you as a college teammate and opponent and player, as well as giving kids that connection to your team. And some things that, that we've done with Western is having high schoolers come up to our practices and practice with us and uh, a lot of people at Western coach at summer camps in Seattle and or help at clinics um, and in Seattle a couple times we've done like ultimate college fairs where we have players from different universities come and talk about their university and high schoolers are able to walk around and kind of talk to different um, club players and coaches about what schools they've been to. Um, but I think that working with youth as a college player can really help um, team dynamics and um, giving and like coaching teaches you so much about how much work it really is to be a captain and a coach on your team and like really thinking about how much uh, those people are having to do outside of just outside of playing and expected to play well usually that um, like I know for me personally being a, a coach or being a captain in my, on my college team like directly related to me learn like me learning how to be a, a coach and then being able to build on that uh, you also a lot of cities have YCC teams which practice weekly at least once a week and like I know that in, I'm also coach, I'm help coaching the girls in Seattle. We have young coaches come in and like come to our practices. And we also, at summer camps that I run, we like give CIT positions even to like high schoolers. So like getting people really young starting to work at camps and working with practices and youth, I think is really important for recruiting for future with your team and for you as a development of a person. <laughs> um, I think the next thing that we sh you should do is evaluating your team culture. Um, thinking about which parts of your team culture do you want to replicate for the year after and really thinking about the actions that are associated with that and how you're doing that um, and not just hoping for the best. And, um, and even if things, even if you think things were like perfect, every year is going to be a little bit different. And I think coming up with like things outside the box and new things that you want to try, um, evolving team culture, and like maybe it's because you want to add like more appreciation to your team, or like redefine positivity, or redefine competition, and thinking about outside, like outside the box, and doing some research on like what other things that you can try. Um, and then if there are things that you want to change about your team culture, um, once again, uh, thinking about actions to actually doing that. So um, at Western, we decided a couple years ago that we really wanted, we really wanted to add um, a culture of appreciation to our team. And at first, it felt really forced to go out of your way to appreciate your teammates, like even if it was something little. And, and like I had to like make time for appreciations at practice. Um, but uh, now they do it on their own and it's like, and it felt really forced at first and then like we've now, like now it happens all the time and like uh, I'm really impressed with how supportive they are and like really buy into each other's growth. 
Um, cool. So if you, for setting goals for, for off, our off-field goals or any goals, I think it's really important to give people a break right after the season. People are, like, burnt out, I'm sure, and, like, or even if things ended really well, like, it's really important to give people a break. Um, and a lot of times I think our instincts are to be super, like, super react to what happened the year before. So, like, we struggled in um, – continuing to be positive in close games. Um, and so, like, the only thing we focus on is that one thing, and we put all of our eggs in that basket, and then we don't really think about being proactive for the next year. Um, and I think it's a little bit of a dangerous slope to, to continue to work on um, just reacting to what has happened in the year before instead of also thinking about... Um, new things that can come about. Sorry, I just realized now that there's also questions from other people, so I'm sorry that I missed that part. Uh, okay, so I'll answer this question really quick. Um, so taking team time for appreciations, like we, like at the end of practices, we like uh, sit in a circle while we stretch, and we're like, okay, it's appreciation time, and like everybody like gets, does shout outs to every, every person. Or we have small, like, buddy groups that we call micro-communities. Um, and I would, like, in the middle of a practice, I might be like, okay, do a micro-community, like, check-in. Like, are you guys understanding the drill? And maybe you can appreciate someone in your group or someone outside your group. And so these are kind of examples of where it's, like, kind of forced at first, but it turns into, like, natural after a little bit of spending time doing that. Um, I think it's important to think about how each individual fits into your team culture. A lot of times we, um, like at, on Western, we've had a lot of similar personalities for a long time. And this year we have a couple people who don't really fit personality-wise, like in the group. Um, and I think there's it's easy to have everyone to just decide that they should come and do whatever you've been doing already. Um, and I think there is some give and take, but I think it's also important to um, figure out how to, how to fit them into your culture, even if they are different, like super extroverted and your team is mostly introverts, or like whatever it is, finding a way to find a compromise within that. And I think thinking about that off season when you're not pairing that with competition is like a really important time to like think about like, individuals that make up your team. Um, and this is where we give each other feedback throughout the year, and I think a lot of times we don't give feedback to people after the season's over. Um, and at that point, it's, it seems a little bit not um, needed. But instead of thinking about it being more feed forward, like what, what can I do to be a better teammate, or what can I do to, like, be a competitor, or what can I do to really be, uh, create, like, a positive, healthy environment. Um, and this could be one-on-one -on -one check-ins with captains and coaches, um, with each individual on the team, or we've also done this with uh, small groups, and um, where, if, like, me and Amy and John and Tom were all in a group and we were giving feedback and I was on the hot seat, I would give my little introduction about, like, what I've been thinking about me growth, as, like, my growth as a leader for, like, 30 seconds. And then Amy would give me pluses and things that I can work on for a minute. And then John would and then Tom would. And I wouldn't actually ask any questions or do anything. And I would just spend the time listening. And then... That would be it. And then afterward, I would be able to have time to ask follow-up questions if needed. Um, and you can do this with on-field stuff, too. But I think it can be really powerful when it's just, like, off-field things and, like, how you fit into your team. And then um, I think this is last, right, uh, is... Um, Spending some time doing some off-season activities, just connecting with your teammates one-on-one -on -one or, like, people that you don't necessarily gravitate to be friends with. Uh, 
can be huge for your team. And I think something that I have tried to do and been not super successful with, but I'm going to maybe try something different, is having like articles or chapters and books like about off-field concepts, about team culture, about team climate, um, mental toughness, all of these things, uh, and assign different articles to different groups and then having them like do like a check-in once a month over the summer. Like it can be super low commitment, but something where they are interacting with each other in the off season. And you can do a similar thing with film sessions. When you're not when you do not doing scouting film sessions and really thinking about uh, like bigger picture things or thinking outside the box of like who, instead of just being like, well, that one person made a turnover, like thinking about like why the why we're recreating teams in these certain situations, um, and yeah, just I think there's a way to view film in the off season that can be really good for working on that proactive goal setting for the next year, um, and then also just find times to be have make like fun, like having fun activities with your teammates. And once again, just gaining those connections, like calling up the people that you talk to the least and like finding time to connect with them. And like I was talking about a ton before, is I really high, highly recommend people to figure out ways to coach. Um, I think it's huge for your own development and I think it's huge for your team's development if more people are coaching on your team. So I think that's it. Hey, yeah, no, that, thanks, Alyssa. Um, I've got a few questions for you myself. Okay. Um, and then I think for anybody who is participating, you know, now's a good time. Feel free to ask any questions you have in the chat, uh, preferably related to off-season stuff, but also just about Alyssa's experience. And if we don't cover them now, hopefully at the time after John's uh, presentation, we'll have some time as well. Um, so, Alyssa, one thing I wanted to ask you, you touched on sort of building, uh, electing leadership. That's a big topic for the offseason. Certainly right now when a lot of teams uh, have finished their season at regionals, um, what are characteristics that you look for in a captain uh, at Western um, when you're helping your team choose captains? Um, and do you do you guys have – younger captains, junior and sophomore captains, um, and what is the integration like for underclassmen and upperclassmen? Yeah, um, okay, so first is that I think about uh, it as more of a captainship and it being a group. Like, I don't think that one person is going to have all of um, – the, all the qualities that you need as a group, but I think it's important, like if you have two or three captains, that they together as a group fill all the qualities that um, that you would need for your group. I think um, besides strategic knowledge of the game, I think it's really important to have captains who are um, good listeners and can show em empathy and can help create a environment where people can have space to learn and to try things that might be hard for them and it's okay to make mistakes. I think that having being able to really support your players growth as a captain can be a huge part and I think a lot of times like I know when I was a captain of Western I spent way too much emphasis on like the strategy and X's and O's stuff and I did not support uh, my teammates very well and I was the center of a lot of conflict that I have like now worked really hard to get better myself as a coach and also help uh, le young leadership on Western now to like really spend more focus on just, I don't know, I think it goes a long way when everyone just knows that they can put a lot of effort in and they want to be around each other and captains being a group of people that help support that environment. Excellent. Um, yeah. So We've got a, another uh, question from Hank and then Brian, and then we'll get to, uh, and then actually two questions from Hank and, then from, and one from Brian, and then we'll get to uh, John's presentation, and then we'll do some more at the end. 
Um, so the first question from Hank is, well, it was a question regarding rookie vet integration. Uh, do, you, do, do your teams, whether it be Western or Riot, do anything to do integration between rookies and vets, like anything in particular? Um, I think, so I think both Riot and Western have like our, our small groups that are called micro, we call them micro communities, whatever you want to call them. And we mix uh, grades or mix levels of experience. So those teams have um, a mixed group. So it's not like all your seniors are in a buddy group and all your freshmen are in a buddy group. Um, and yeah, that is still something like Western um, had a little bit of an issue with this this year. And basically I put it on the upperclassmen to really reach out and, um, and not just like invite their friends to do things, but every like full team or certain certain people that they're not used to talking to, and I I really put it on the upperclassmen to be responsible for um, making sure that inclusion of like rookies are is happening. Cool, excellent. A quick question for Brian: How do you find good film to watch and study? Well, luckily, there's way more film now than online for free than there ever was when I was in college. And uh, <laughs> I like, I don't like USAU's YouTube channel has a bunch of stuff. And if you want to watch Riot play, Riot has like more footage than like any team that's like public online. And um, the whatever the like. Alti World and Sky also have like on their YouTube channels also have footage. Um, there's also a lot if you, a lot of times if you reach out to other teams that have have footage, if you like promise not to post them, there's a lot of teams that also are willing to share footage. Like I know that Western has asked certain other teams to be able to use their like use their footage just for our own personal use and not to post. And most people have been um, willing to share with us. So. That would be cool. where I would go. Cool. And then the last question before we get to John's presentation. Um, what has been a good procedure for you personally for the time out of school but before nationals? So what I guess I, that might be a question of what is Western doing now uh, to get ready? Uh, yeah, because we're, we're still – we're still in school, and we actually are still, Western is still in school for like two more weeks after nationals. Oh, wow. Um, so, uh, so um, and that's like a lot of the schools out here. A lot of the schools, people aren't graduating until middle of June. But um, right now we are spending a lot of time on uh, in-game adjustments, and a lot of, we call them situation rooms, like scrimmages with certain stipulations. So like, for example, after regionals, one thing that we struggled with was like, we had one strategy that normally works for us and it wasn't working. And it is the superpower of some of our handlers, which is like looking deep. But in our last game, we were tired and it wasn't working very well. So like what was actually working really, really well was changing direction and coming under. And like, really getting over the fact that like our main handlers, like that might not be your superpower, but like getting over your own superpower to play within the team's superpower. So like last, so like the past couple of weekends at practices, we've been spending a lot of times of like restricting our offensive sets so that we are thinking about, okay, right now our team superpower is this and whatever it is, we're all going to do it together. And like, we're all gonna get on board and buy into whatever that is. And I think having a supportive team culture is super important to be able to do that. Because if you don't trust in the fact that like, you don't trust the leadership that this is a good idea. And if you don't trust that your teammates are trying to play within a style that might be a little bit different for them and they might make mistakes, um, then it becomes like more of a struggle to be able to do that when you need to. So mostly it's just small adjustments, but we're still in school, so <laughs> they're in class. <laughs> Fair enough. So maybe maybe that's one that John might have uh, have some input on. Uh, let's get uh, to John's presentation now. Uh, I think UNC might be might be done. Am I am I wrong about that, John? 
Uh, no, UNC's, UNC's done. UNC's been done since May 4th area. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, so there's usually about a three-week gap between when we finish up school uh, and when nationals occurs. Um, do you want me to go ahead and answer that question from UNC's perspective or wait till the end? Uh, you can go ahead and answer it and then uh, uh, feel free to get started in your presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah, so most of what Alyssa mentioned is the same thing for us. Uh, we spent a lot of time um, in that brief two and a half, three week period. Um, it's a lot of review uh, and focusing on details like what Alyssa called like the situation room in terms of working on actual like game scenarios and trying to work with in-game adjustments and individual adjustments and just having to deal with certain circumstances, um, whether that be playing a, a game where we set the score at 12-9 with one team down and focusing on them having to come back and win that game. Um, little stuff like that, but most of what we do is we're reviewing our fundamentals. Um, our last two and a half weeks of the season looks eerily similar to our first like two and a half weeks of the season where we're just covering our basics one more time. Um, and then it's a lot of run through and just going through the motions to try and ingrain, ingrain that one time. Um, but as far as like team culture stuff, the only thing we really prioritize is making sure everyone stays together. Um, most years we've had the benefit of having a lot of upperclassmen who live off campus. So most of our underclassmen kind of uh, squat, basically, and just crash at the upperclassmen's houses um, until nationals occurs. Because um, one of the biggest things for us is keeping that core group together, let that team culture and that team bonding happen all the way up until nationals. So I hope that answers that question. Um, all right, so I'll jump straight into this, and I'll roll through, and then I'll try and hit as many questions as I can after the fact. Um, so Alyssa hit a lot of the kind of team culture stuff, leadership stuff, um, and what I'm going to try and focus on a little bit more is just kind of off-season strategies to improve your in-season performance on an individual basis. Um, so it'll be less geared towards leadership and more geared towards skill development and similar things. Um, quick quote, just to give you kind of an idea of my approach and kind of the UNC's team approach and any other team that I'm on, um, this is kind of how we look at it. During the season, we're doing everything we can to make sure individuals are on the same page and doing what they should be doing to help the team succeed. But as far as when we're in our off season, we're trying to help you be the best player you can be and develop to the best of your interest uh, through whatever avenue that is. So um, it's, we're going to kind of divide this up hopefully into what will be clear uh, four stages. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about planning for improvement because that tends to be um, something that can be overlooked at times. Then actually building on that plan in terms of how to develop skills and trying to craft your approach a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about using different levels of play and different play environments to create opportunities to learn and learn skills in different ways. And the last thing we're talking about is actually transitioning skills you build in the offseason into your role and your team as you flow back into the college season. So um, as far as the main goal of this, there should be hopefully something new you learn out of this as far as information goes. But I hope that a lot of this, if nothing else, if it's not new information, it's at least information that affirms things you've already been doing and shows you that those are correct what you, with the approach you have been following. Um, we'll start pretty simple. The first goal of your off-season, if you're geared towards individual improvement, uh, should be to make a plan and actually set goals. Um, I mean, development, the more you play, the more you'll develop just somewhat naturally. Uh, repetitions do a wonderful job of helping you generate better skills. Uh, but that process can be expedited quite a bit with actually focusing on goals and specific things to improve on. 
Um, I put Be Smart here. Hopefully some of you are familiar with that acronym, uh, but it's a big goal-setting tactic. Uh, I mean, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. The biggest thing when you're setting off-season goals, uh, these five things are huge, especially if you're doing athletic-type goals, like maybe let's say something in the gym, uh, you're looking on increasing your squat max, uh, or let's say it's something still in the athletic court category, maybe you're trying to be faster in a 10-yard box. Those are the type of things that are easy to make measurable, um, and you can kind of do those in a more time-bound process. You can say, all right, I'm going to try and be two-tenths of a second faster in a 15-yard you know, sprint in the next month and a half. Um, what's a little bit harder to actually make measurable and time-bound are those physical skills that have to do with actual, like ultimate specific skills, whether that's throwing, whether that's reading a disc, um, things that you consider to be a lot more focused towards ultimate skill and rest less towards athletic skill. Um, so one big thing I recommend is if you can find a way to make goals measurable and time-bound, go for it. Uh, but the big three for me are specific, attainable, and relevant uh, whenever I'm setting individual off-season goals. Um, and before I actually jump into making any goals, what we always recommend our players to do is solicit feedback. Um, obviously, you can set goals on your own, but it's super helpful to actually ask teammates, and you can follow some of the same routines as what Alyssa suggested with the hot seat approach, uh, where you talk about with teammates or captains or leadership things that you see in your own game that you think are positives and maybe places to work on, and use them as good tools to provide you with feedback to either affirm that you're right in what you're saying or say, hey, maybe you're a little off base. I think these are more of your strengths and weaknesses. Um, soliciting feedback is one of the biggest things you can do because it helps you get more specific and especially if you're soliciting feedback from captains and coaches, relevant goals because you can apply. They can tell you kind of where they see you progressing as a player within the team and within your role and you can set questions accordingly. Um, the other, the kind of four stages I go through when it comes to setting goals um, and I still do this, is the first thing I do is always, and I solicit feedback before I start this process, but I identify strengths and weaknesses. Um, if you have, you need to have a grasp of where you are and what things you have that are good and what things you have that are weak as far as your skills go before you can really implement a specific plan on improving those things. So that's where I always start is I do a little kind of player profile. Uh, and get as much feedback as you can on that from anybody you kind of trust as a responsible, reliable source. The second thing I do, and I always encourage, and, and there's lots of different ways to approach this, um, so my way isn't always the only way to do it, but I always encourage players to build a strength first before they focus on anything else. Uh, Alyssa talked about it a little bit when she was saying superpowers, and I think it's a bit of the same thing. Basically find what makes you, a, basically, what is your strength as a player? What, Whenever someone asks you what you're best at, what do you say? Um, for me, it's, it tends to be like forehand hucks. Um, and then once I know what my strength is, I can work from there. Um, and move to step three, which is train your weaknesses. And in general, like you will always have a superpower, but as Alyssa pointed out, those are not always going to be something you're going to be able to utilize. So it's important that you actually train your weaknesses in the weak areas of your game to try and make sure you are a well-rounded player. Um, because the only way you're ever going to be at the level that hopefully you are aspiring to be is if you kind of build up and minimize your weaknesses and maximize multiple strengths, uh, even if you do have one superpower. Um, and then four is always polish strengths, because even while I'm training weaknesses, I always want to keep it. It's a strength for a reason, and you always want to, if you have a superpower, you always want to maintain it. So make sure you do not neglect that in the process of training other things. As far as building skills go, this is probably the, the harder and more time-intensive process. Uh, and the first thing I'll say when it comes to building skills is mindset is, a, is an important thing and understanding kind of how the learning process works. Um, and it's important for you to also understand how you learn. Um, there's some generalities to the learning process that kind of everybody learns 
many things in the same way, but you specifically might learn through one medium better than another. Uh, so try and figure that out for yourself and apply it accordingly. The biggest things I'll say when it comes to improvement is it doesn't happen overnight. Um, you have to spend a lot of time getting a lot of reps and work. Uh, and growth is usually an incremental thing. Uh, and you have to tend, you tend to have to do a lot of investment and failure uh, for things, let's say throwing as an example. Uh, whenever I'm trying to work on a new throw, the first few times I'm working with it, and really as I continue to work on it, I usually aim for, well not aim for, but I judge it as a success if I'm in the 15 to 35 percent range as far as a failure rate. Uh, so I want to be messing up anywhere from one out of four to one out of three of my throws when I'm like throwing with a partner uh, to try and develop a new throw. Um, in game, I don't like to be that high or any in, in drill settings. Uh, but when you're throwing one on one and trying to develop skills in isolation, um, I look for somewhere 15 to 35 percent is a good good measuring stick of how many times I'm messing it up because um, that usually denotes to me that I'm trying to expand that box and my comfort level with a skill. Um, and if you're not constantly pushing the boundary a little bit, you're not going to improve as quickly. Um, on top of that, when it comes to skill, start simple. Start at a foundational level and build and layer complexity and difficulty as you go. If you want to be a better backhand thrower, the first thing you should, should start with shouldn't be 75-yard backhand hooks. Uh, if you want to be a better backhand thrower, start simple. Work on your angle control. See if you can complete... 20-yard passes before you jump to 70-yard passes. Uh, I'm definitely a fan of mixing it up and doing a bit of both, um, but you have to lay a foundation before you start jumping way beyond it. Um, and then when it comes after that, I always also encourage people to revisit old skills. I call it a, like reinvestment in skill development because often you'll find if you have practiced one skill, let's say you got good at hammers, um, but it's been a while since you've worked on them and you learned how to throw scubers different ways. Um, revisiting a hammer after learning a scuba may teach you a little bit more when you practice that again because every time you learn a new throw, you gain a little bit more understanding of flight path and how a disc operates. So learning different things and then reinvesting in trying to redevelop at a higher level old skills uh, can have a good benefit. And the last thing I'll say for the most part about skill development is there aren't any shortcuts for, for most things, but when it comes to skill development, if there is a shortcut, imitation is the best way to go. Um, there's people out there and there's a lot of video of great players who have great skills. Um, and especially great players who have very specifically great skills. If it's a skill you want to have, find a player that does it well, watch them on video, and try and mimic that as much as possible. Uh, mim mimicry is one of the best ways to learn. Uh, your body does a pretty good job of, of mimicking uh, somewhat naturally. Uh, so if something you want to be good at is an around flick break, Jimmy Mickle has a great around flick break. Watch him on film. Watch how he sets it up with his body and try and mimic that motion. Um, you can expedite that learning process by, you know, not cheating, but if someone has already invested a lot of time and a lot of energy in learning something, instead of you doing the same thing, try and figure out what they know. Try and steal from them by, mim by imitating, uh, and hopefully that will jumpstart your development as well. Uh, let's see. The third thing we're going to talk about as far as skill development goes, and I think this is one of the most important ones, is finding the right environment for your skills to develop. Um, in the off season, hopefully you have lots of playing opportunities, um, or at least diff a lot of different avenues for play. Um, and I just want to briefly touch on maybe a couple of different ways you can use different levels of competition to practice and sharpen your skill set. Um, the first thing I'm going to encourage before I jump into that is as far as building skills, try to build them in isolation. If you want to learn how to throw an offhand backhand, you shouldn't try that at your first elite club practice. Uh, you should probably try that in a one-on-one -on -one or small group setting uh, in a, like, a throwing training session. 
build skills in isolation where you get comfortable with them and you kind of understand a certain skill. Uh, and then as you do that, you can actually bring them into competitive settings. Um, and I've got a couple of different competitive settings here listed. Um, and really, you know, this should cover mostly the full range. I might be leaving something out, but this is at least mostly the range that I've been involved in and has been instrumental to my development. Um, and I'll reference it a little bit throughout this talk, but at the bottom right there, you'll see slowing down to speed up and speeding up to slow down. Um, and when I'm, when I'm talking about slowing down and speeding up, I'm talking about game speed mostly. Um, and obviously, the higher level of play you are participating in, the faster the game will move. Um, in general, uh, there are some exceptions, but in general. And the lower you play, the slower that game will be uh, in comparative comparison. Recreational pickup is going to be a lot different in terms of game speed than elite club, uh, unless you're playing recreational pickup with elite club players. That might be the only exception to that. Um, but as far as environment goes, I always you build skills in isolation, and then I want the goal is always to adapt those skills through what I call leveling, which is just basically running up the level and or, or the chain, if you will, when trying to implement a new skill. Uh, if the skill you're trying to implement is, uh, let's say you're trying to work on your dump defense. You wouldn't go from talking about that and reading it in an article and working on it in a visual to just jumping straight in an elite club setting trying to play dump defense. You can definitely do that and you will learn how to play better dump defense, but your fail rate might be a little bit higher and you might not internalize the concepts you're trying to learn and the techniques you're trying to um, learn as well as if you started in a little bit slower environment. Um, the benefit of starting in that slower environment, let's say a pickup game, is you have a little bit more time to process what you should be doing and focus on your technique a little bit. And once you kind of get an understanding of the technique and the concepts, then as it becomes a little bit more automatic, that actual decision-making process behind the skill, the mental side of a skill, you can jump up. Um, and that's where you're going to speed it up. And a lot of times I think of that kind of speeding up where you increase the level of play. Um, those are the chances for you to maximize basically the challenge behind the learning process and your efficiency within those movements because you'll have to do them at a lot more challenging rate and a lot faster pace. Um, and what I always encourage is not to just go up the chain, but also down the chain. Um, if I'm trying to learn a new throw, I'll work on it in isolation. And then oftentimes, the first place I'll try it is either in pickup or a lead game. Uh, and once I get a little bit of a good feel for it and feel like I can comfortably complete it, um, then I might try it at a club or college practice. Um, and once I do that and maybe complete a couple and get really comfortable with that skill, I'll go right back to a league game or a recreational game and try and implement that skill there again. And the benefit of that is once you've played at a faster level of play, um, you should have a better understanding of how to implement that technique, and it should be a bit more automatic uh, and operating a little bit more at a subconscious level. Um, because it's going to have to be a little bit faster if you want to complete it in the windows that are available at higher levels of competition. And by going back to lower levels of competition, it's going to allow you the time to actually consciously process, uh, let's say if it's a high release flick you're working on, it's going to let you consciously process the actual release and the space you're trying to hit um, and spend more conscious effort and conscious focus towards those skills, um, which helps you refine them little by little uh, into the nice little details where you can almost master a skill. Um, obviously, the more you can practice that at an elite club level, uh, the better you'll get. But there is a lot of benefit to playing up and down that chain. Um, let's see. I'll jump to the next. Oh, sorry. One last thing. Uh, the other benefit of having these different levels of play is you can train multiple skills at once. Uh, I generally encourage you to try and focus on one skill at a time but you can focus on one skill at a time within each level of play. For example, you might be focusing on implementing a new throw at the recreational pickup level for a little bit, um, while at the club practice, you might be working on your ability to 
to get open on upline cuts. Um, and the difference in levels can let you compartmentalize a bit uh, and focus on different skills and different tasks that you want to get better at, which hopefully speeds up your skill development and lets you get better at multiple things in the, about, in the same amount of time or a little bit more. Um, but less than what you would be if you tried to focus on just one skill through all levels once at a time. And the last part is putting skills into context. Uh, skills are only as important as your ability to use them. If you're never going to use an offhanded backhand in a game, you should probably prioritize another skill in place of that. Um, and if your role is never going to be it, be to throw a 50-yard throw in a game, there's probably better skills you could work on in the short term. Um, there's definitely a good argument for developing those skills at some point, um, but as far as making specific and relevant skills, I always think of those in the context of what are you most likely going to be doing. Um, and that's where the feed, and this is going to cycle right back into part one. This is where the feedback from coaches and captains comes in. So when you're moving back into a college season, you can ask your coaches where they see you probably fitting into a team and try and work to adapt those skills accordingly. Um, hopefully, before the season starts and really when the, the previous season ends, you have a little bit of maybe at least a guess of where you will be the next year in terms of role and your goal setting can accommodate that. Um, but it's going to take a little bit of time from the beginning of your college season to incorporate your new skills into the new context because the role you were playing on an elite club, uh, let's say you were on an elite club team and you were playing as a reset handler, you might have gained a lot of skills that would make you a dominant college handler. But it's going to take a little while for you to orient those skills and navigate kind of that new role if you play, if you move up from being a reset handler to a main handler on uh, your college team. Uh, and one of the things I always encourage is kind of periodizing, just like you would a workout uh, or a gym routine, but splitting up your development and your transition uh, phases of your skills into, uh, into chunks and basically separate, let's say, your fall season into three different categories. One where you can just focus on uh, maybe messing up to get it right and then a little bit of sharpening that skill in the last phase of just kind of funneling those skills where you really sink into your role and are only executing the skills you need for that role. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably close on time if we want to hit a lot of questions. Uh, there's some more stuff in here uh, as far as a case study, but we can deal with that later if need be. Uh, but I think probably the rest of the time, hopefully that hit most of it, but the rest of the time will probably be beneficial to answer questions. But I'll defer to you on that, Tom. Thanks, John. I uh, know that was that was great. Um, definitely a lot of good information there. I've got a couple questions for you um, and a few questions that have come up already. Uh, for everybody else, now is the time to start thinking about things you want to ask to either Alyssa or John uh, and use the chat function to ask those questions. Um, so the first question came from William, and that is, how often does dark side play three on three? Uh, so sort of a drill specific uh, uh, question there. Uh, we play three by three v three in some capacity at every single practice the entire year. Um, and then we tend to, we had, over the past few years, we've had a weekly three v three specific night. Uh, I think it, it's usually Tuesday night threes uh, is the, the nickname we have for it. Uh, and that's an outside of practice event where guys just got together to play 3v3. Um, but we play a ton of 3v3 because the benefit, in our opinion, is it breaks offense down into this, like the foundational concepts. Rarely are you focusing on more than one person at a time uh, until you get to a really pretty complex level of field vision. And if you can understand how to move based on each other, which is easier to do in that minimized number of people, uh, those concepts carry over when there's more people and more clutter on the field, just the same as when there's just two other people on the field. So we play every practice in some context, and we switch it up a lot in terms of the rules and the stall count 
in the size of the space we play on. But every practice we play threes in some capacity. So, cool. Um, Kevin asked, "What should I encourage players to do who don't have club or summer league in their area?" So, um, I don't know if there are any North Carolina players that you've dealt with who aren't quite near enough to a league, or um, so you know, they might just be them and a buddy. What would you do? What would, what do you encourage players to do? Uh, well, when you cannot play in necessarily a competitive environment, uh, one of the things that you can always do is focus on athletic development. That's a big one. That's something you will constantly need to improve on throughout your career. So if you're by yourself, that's something you can always do. If you have a partner, what we encourage a lot of time, there's tons of things you can do in small groups, whether it's two people or three people especially. Um, that is extremely beneficial. If you want to improve throws, there's, I mean, Ben Wiggins has the Kung Fu throwing routine. Um, I'm sorry, Lou Burris does, and then I think Ben Wiggins has the, the Zen, and both of those I think are fantastic routines. And, you know, they do a lot of the things that are helpful in developing skills. They get you really focusing on small details and really stretch your box as a thrower. Um, so we encourage a lot of that because obviously throwing is a pretty big part of the game. But other things we have them do is just, I mean, you can work on technique development, let's say dump defense uh, just with one other person. Um, even if you can't do it full speed, let's say you don't have a third person actually make that throw, you can work on the footwork and the positioning um, and treat, you can put a cone down where the thrower would be and actually just go through that type of stuff. Um, but with limited resources, we try and either encourage them to create like some form of pickup and uh, any type of play, even if it's not competitive, or do something like the other two things I suggested. Um, that's that's good. Um, one question from Gretchen, actually, both you, I mean, I'd actually be interested to hear both your opinion and Alyssa's opinion. Um, for new players without a lot of athletic experience, so as, as a coach, um, what have you suggested to them for conditioning? Like, and what experience have you had with those types of players? Uh, that are new to ultimate or new to athletics in general? Uh, let's go with athletics in general, and then, and then also so, as a subtopic, new to ultimate. Uh, yeah, so I guess to athletic in gen athletics in general, the first... One of the most important things for us is coordination uh, in, in your movement patterns. Uh, so we try and give them things, any, any type of basically field workout, whether it's like ladders for footwork or whether it's actually specific movements we want them to do, uh, like adapted shuttle runs or things of that nature that mimic ultimate movements. We try and get them to focus on that so they'll be more coordinated in their actual athletic movements on the field. Um, but other than that, the first thing, one of the first things we always do with our uh, our rookies at UNC is we have a gym training session um, over the span of two weeks. We have about five training sessions for any rookies who are new to the weight room and vets show up and anybody else who's an experienced lifter shows up, and we walk through uh, basically all the basic lifts we'll be using in our workout program throughout the year um, and make sure their, fun, their form is sound and all that um, so that they can spend time on their own developing as an athlete. So, cool. Alyssa, do you, have, do you have any experience with that, with, with newer players and newer athletes coming to Western? Yeah, uh, a lot. <laughs> Uh, last year was like the first time we ever had a B team, so until then we everybody who wanted to play got to be on our A team. And uh, I think a lot of the similar things John was talking about is doing things like ladders or things with discs are a little bit easier for people to like want to be excited about them. They're like, all right, we're gonna go run a bunch of hundreds or something, and like that's not really that fun for someone who's just starting to work out. We've also done like uh like gym sessions and also we were lucky enough to have like someone like Ren Caldwell and she came up to Western and like did a clinic with the players on the team and because even some of our more experienced players and like are fine with the track and running workouts a lot of them 
lifting is still like a thing we're working on being more normalized within the team. But mostly it's similar in what John said. Fair enough. Cool. Uh, John, there's a question for you uh, out there that we're going to come back to. Um, what do you practice when you're developing your flick hook? Uh, well, I, I had a lot of benefit of other, um, a, a sport background that allowed kind of some development of that kind of naturally. I played baseball for 16 years, and a lot of the kind of motion involved in throwing one goes into that. Um, so as far as power, that's something that came from playing a lot of sports over um, when I was playing youth sports uh, and all the way through high school. But as far as accuracy and developing kind of edge control and, and being able to throw the disc where I want to throw it, I mean, a lot of that is, is I don't know if I used a ton of drills. One of the main ones we used is, I, it's one we call triangle of death, but it's basically just half a hucking drill and half a conditioning drill where it's just two lines of cutters um, and the thrower is basically running between two horizontal running horizontally between two cones and every time he catches it he turns and looks up field and works on throwing a huck um, but uh, outside of that I just spent a lot of time throwing after practices um, and really kind of pushing my box and my boundaries on what I could do. And I messed it up a lot. And I, I mean, Mike Donardis, who's the coach at UNC, will also tell you over the first three years of my career, I spent a lot of time throwing turnovers in games, um, which was uh, not the best in the short term, but benefited me a lot long term. Um, but yeah, I mean, where I get most of my growth in terms of Throw development has definitely been one-on-one -on -one sessions where I'm really focusing on um, and, and being really hard on myself as far as trying to hit a certain space on the field um, and trying to do it with a certain angle or edge on the disc. Um, and I always try, I mean, I'm big on visualization, so I always try and imagine um, of someone marking me in a space slash receiver that I'm trying to hit. Um, but outside of that, those are, I mean, those are probably the two main things I do. Yeah, I was, I was going to add one other thing that I've done before is having someone videotape me doing it and actually see, like, mashing, one, like, form to, like, the results that I had planned in my head, like, when I wanted to do a certain curve and go to a certain space, like, what was I doing that I can repeat, um, Although this might answer some of the other questions when you don't have a throwing partner. I've like gone with a pile of like 10 to 20 discs, set up a target, and then like I did it so like before Worlds tryouts, I was in Atlanta, and in Atlanta everyone works regular nine to five jobs, <laughs> unlike Seattle. So there was no one to like throw with <laughs> during the day when I was there. And so I literally, I tied up a sweatshirt and a soccer goal, and I went from like, I went from like 10, 15, 20 yards away and then like at different angles trying to like hit someone someone in the like sweatshirt basically. Um, and it just takes some focus to be able to do that for that long time. Yep, I've definitely done that a bunch. Thrown, I've thrown at a lot of lacrosse goals for target practice when I'm by myself, so. Okay. That's awesome, thanks. thanks. I, when I was playing, I'm not playing very much anymore, I was doing the same thing. Um, question for both of you from Brennan. Uh, what would a typical, what should a typical practice look like? I mean, that's a little bit of in-season, but um, do, you, do you have like a framework for a practice that you tend to build around? Alyssa, do you want this first or do you want me to attack it? Uh, uh, sure, I can do it quick. So one thing, so one thing that Western did this year, which I kind of took from Sockeye, I think, is like we did our warm up and then we did a set of Hollywood squares, which is like a, uh, like an agility <laughs> drill basically, and but and have throws in it. So before we even started doing anything, 
we warmed up and then we went immediately into this and like immediately I could start seeing the difference in their change of direction and their throws. Like before we even start practice, they've now thrown the disc however many times within this. Um, and then like our kind of regular structure is then like some like skill drills, like a five pole or something like that or a stop disc rep, uh, depending on what we're actually focusing on. And then some kind of full scrimmaging situation room, and then possibly another like uh, drill, and then like a five pull, and then like some kind of scrimmaging. And the way that we run it, because I'm. Uh oh. Uh, uh oh. Melissa, looks like you cut out for a second. Your phone cut out. There, she's back. I can jump in on this question. Yeah, John, do you want to jump in while, yeah. while let's figure out technical difficulties? Um, so I think there's another question about how long it should ask, so I'll try and combine both. Uh, UNC's practices typically last right on two hours um, if you're including warm-up time. And our general, we, we generally follow the same structure, um, but it changes a little bit depending on what point in the season we're at. Um, we always warm up first, um, you know, we jog a lap and do our normal warm up. We do uh, some ladder drills to get started and get just kind of get our footwork warmed up. Um, and three days a week for two hours. Uh, and then after we do our ladders kind of drills, after we get our bodies actually ready to move, uh, we always jump into the first thing we always do is some type of, Alyssa mentioned Hollywood Squares, we, we do something something that is skill specific but is not actually teaching. Um, and it's the, the idea is something that builds on the warm up and we don't want to warm up and then talk for 15 minutes because that in our opinion is a less efficient process and kind of wastes the warm up um, time. So we jump, a lot of times that's 3v3, we'll do, uh, we might do full length field 3v3, but it might be really narrow if the field might only be 15 yards wide. Or we'll do wide field, what we call wide field threes, uh, where we start at half field to play full width. Um, or we might break up and, and do normal actual 3v3. Uh, sometimes we do 4v4 uh, and we'll throw, we always try and throw different um, kind of rules or adaptations on whatever we do to just try and challenge our players to adjust and adapt on a daily basis. Um, after that, we jump into skill development, and we usually have maximum two concepts we're teaching that day. Usually, it's just one. So let's say it's traps, and we're super specific in terms of concepts. Uh, if we're teaching defense, the topic will be trap side handler defense uh, rather than just like handler defense. Um, we'll teach that, probably talk about it for five minutes going over technique, then we'll actually just break up and do it for a while in like 2v2 stations, uh, thrower, marker, dump, and dump defender. We'll do that for a few reps, bring it back in, layer in a little bit of complexity on the technique, uh, talk about some main things where we see people are going wrong and how to adjust it, and then we'll go back to actually performing that for another 8 to 10 minutes. We might add in one more drill to try and reinforce that in a more game-like session, and after that we scrimmage if there's time left over. So, um, and as we progress through the ski, through the season, it slowly becomes less teaching. Uh, we almost never go over one concept, more than one concept. In the fall, we'll do two a lot of nights, um, and we'll spend more time scrimmaging. So, that's the basic structure. Just changes based on what we're teaching that night. Cool. So, yeah, thanks. Um, Going to move towards another question from Kevin, more focused on the off season, uh, and take just a couple more. Um, Alyssa has some technical technical difficulties, so I'm going to try and relay uh, her communication for um, to answer some of these questions. Uh, Kevin asks, college teammates live all over the state, multiple states. What's the best way to keep an open line of communication with teammates uh, and track slash encourage their personal growth? Um, so, I'll. Uh, um, I'll relay Alyssa's comments first, which are um, Google Hangouts, Snapchat, watching footage at the same time, 
you know, things like that. Posting a workout selfie uh, is another another big one. So once you're done with a, uh, a workout, post a selfie, send it to your teammates. Um, make sure your teammates know you're working. Uh, that's a great way to do it. John, do you have any other suggestions along those lines? Uh, she hit the nail on the head. The biggest thing for UNC is making sure your teammates know you're working. We have a listserv, and we're old-fashioned. We still send emails out uh, like once a week just to update each other on progress. Um, but one thing we do every year that I really like is we do a Google Doc, um, and we have uh, one of our captains from last year, Justin Moore, started this process a few years back, and it's just it's a color-coded Google Doc, and it's got every day of the summer listed on it. Um, and you just are supposed to fill in, and each individual on the team has a page up there, and you're supposed to fill in um, with the appropriate color what you did every day to improve. Um, and that's a good way. I mean, it's out there, and it's it's amongst the entire team, so everybody can see who's working and who's not and how they're working. Um, and, you know, some people do more than others, but it's nice because we always see what each other are doing, and maybe we can decide, oh, like, I like that he's doing throwing three times a week. Maybe I'll do that. Um, so that's one really cool thing that I've always loved that we do. Awesome. Awesome. Um, any other questions right now, sort of postseason, offseason related? Um, definitely a chance if, you know, if you – you can think about it. You don't have to ask them now. Um, both Alyssa, you can email me, and I can get these questions to Alyssa and John. Or uh, John, are you available through Twitter, email, anywhere that you, people can ask you questions? Yeah, any any of those are fine. Uh, email, Twitter, Facebook, messages, any of that, any of that jazz. Uh, your Twitter is at Nether. What, what's your Twitter handle again? Uh, Nevercuts seven. No, so are you a list as ACL? Is that right? <laughs> hey, I just want to add that it's so great that we have John and Alyssa who are involved at all three divisions of USA Ultimate. We have youth, college, and club, and they're at high levels, and it's really cool how much information you guys have and yeah, you're able to ask them so many great questions because they know all the answers. It's really exciting. Uh, actually, Alyssa will be masters too. Check that out. Um, Dan, we did talk a little bit about recruitment. Uh, we have some – the video, this is going to be posted. Um, certainly, it's going to be posted to the USA Ultimate website. Uh, if you have any – you know, any questions, you can definitely watch that. And if you have any other questions, both Liz and John are available uh, as well. Just because we're running a little bit over and short on time, before we go, um, I want to do one one quick thing, which is sort of plug what USA Ultimate is trying to do and sort of the direction we're moving with things like these webinars. Um, our goal is to get people resources uh, and help people build sustainable ultimate teams, build their ultimate careers uh, in ways that we haven't done before and, and interact with people in a new way, which is why we're going to be doing a lot more webinars. You got a lot of emails about them from me this season, uh, and you're going to continue to get more next season, um, hoping people like John and Alyssa can continue to stay involved. Um, one of the other things that we have started, uh, started doing, um, I think you can, can you all see what's up on my screen? Amy, can you see it? The uh, ACE website? Do you need to make it bigger? Yes? No? Yeah, bigger would be great. Bigger? Did that work? That better? All right. So um, so one of the things we've started doing uh, this year is the ACE program, Achieving Collegiate Excellence. Um, and so our goal here is to help Give teams recognition that teams, not just the teams that are making nationals, but teams that are building sustainable programs uh, that eventually could make nationals but aren't quite there yet. Um, and so what we've done is we've built an application process uh, where you can get recognized through USA Ultimate. Um, there are a bunch of different tiers. I definitely encourage you all to check it out. 
uh, and apply the application window just opened. Um, our, there's lots of cool benefits. Uh, Breakmark is a sponsor of the program, and there's some free gear uh, to teams that get honored. And the other benefit, the, one of the real benefits that we see um, here in the ACE program is that for you and your schools, you can now go to your school sports department and say, hey, we're a five-star team. We've done this, this, and this. And it's, you know, it's, it's not just, uh, you know, competing well on the field, but it's doing things like things that Alyssa mentioned, which is coaching youth, um, getting involved in your ultimate community, getting involved in your community, getting involved in your school community, uh, and, and in the hopes that with that recognition, they will then provide you more funds, more resources, more access to fields. Um, we know that it is hard for a lot of teams, especially new teams, uh, to get those resources to start. And this is just one way that we're trying to figure out how to help teams do that. Um, so hope you guys get involved. Uh, would love um, would, uh, would would love to hear your feedback on it. Um, once you do, and once you do apply. Um, so, uh, just wanted to plug that. Now, if I can get that off my screen. There we go. Got it off. Um, that's all about all we have today. Amy, do you have anything to add on the ACE program? Um, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, Alyssa and John, thank you so much. Um, if you guys could uh, stick around, I think we'll, we'll end here. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions, you can uh, tweet at uh, you know me, Alyssa. Uh, my my Twitter, by the way, is at tmano. It's USAU. Um, although I think Alyssa and John are probably a little bit more interesting than me. Uh, so uh, thanks again, and uh, have a great night, everybody.